everybody starts looking up, are these guys dead? Did this happen? Well, I mean, one of the most common things on Google was like, is Sean Rogerson dead? Hello, everyone. I hope you're all having a wonderful day today. My name is Talal, and you are listening to the Popcorn and Soda Podcast, the show where we discuss all things movies, pop culture, and so much more. I want to thank each and every one of you for making me a small part of your day. On today's show, we are joined by a very special guest. He is one of Canada's finest actors, With credits to his name, such as Smallville, Harper's Island, 12 Rounds 2, Z, and the modern day classic, Grave Encounters. The movie, which is celebrating its 10 year anniversary, continues to be a shining light in the great horror movies of the 21st century. On the show today, Mr. Sean Rogerson. How are you, Sean? Pretty good. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for coming to hang out on the show today. It means a lot. How have you been these last 12 months? We're living in such a crazy world. What have you been doing to keep busy? And overall, how's your sanity in, in this time? You know what, man? I think it's, it's probably like most actors would say. Um, most of us are recluses um, a- until we go out and have to socialize for business. But um, yeah, it's been pretty okay. I got a little one, so she's been keeping me busy. There you um, go. You know, having her around all the time was pretty awesome during COVID. So I, I guess it's still during COVID. So, um, but uh, she's really young. So she's at school and, and, and that's, you know, it didn't interfere with anything with her. So um, yeah, I don't know. It's been, it's been okay, man. It hasn't really changed my life too much, to be honest. Gotcha. And where are you currently? Are you out West or? Yeah, Vancouver. Vancouver. All right. Yeah. Overall, how's the... The scene in Vancouver, I know here in Toronto, we've, we've been on a strict lockdown for the last like 20 days. What's going on yeah. in Vancouver? Yeah, I've spoken with a few of my buddies there in Toronto and they say how, how tough it is. Um, Vancouver was good. It's, you know, you notice the difference from city life to suburban life. Like if I go out to the suburbs at the beginning of COVID, nobody was wearing masks. Mm-hmm. Everybody was super relaxed. No, taken it seriously but in the city everybody's masked up um and we did really good at that first you know uh onslaught of covid and kept the numbers down and everything and then you know everything got laxed it went to parties i can't yeah. remember i think it was halloween and uh then there was an influx after that um people going to bars parties gatherings um you know and now we're like everybody else yeah you know restrictions on uh, not businesses all businesses are still open you can still go to restaurants and stuff oh wow just on bars and stuff and you can't have uh, uh people outside of your bubble in your home gotcha so, gotcha but other than that everything's 2021 yeah. here uh hopefully sometime this year we'll return to somewhat of a normal i guess you know just keeping our distance and just following our basic protocols right yeah i mean i i think it's gonna go back somewhat to normal but you know, we're going to have to deal with everybody not wanting to get the vaccine yeah. versus the people that want to. And how can you, you can't, you can't make people do it. So it's. We'll just see, man, we just got to hang in there. <laughs> yeah. Well, it'll be what it'll be. Yeah. So let's dive right into your career. You've had such an interesting career, especially with some of the diverse roles and characters that you have played. So where does this all start? what were some of your influences growing up and what made you want to be an actor? I was, I was a movie, uh, like crazy person. Every weekend I would get some movies. I worked at three different video stores in my small town. And so I would get movies and I would go home and I would close my door. If anybody knocked on that door, I was like in there and I want to, I want to focus and uh, big influence to me was uh, Denzel Washington. I just like loved his movies. And I would honestly, I would lock myself in my room and I would just like, just couldn't wait to feel whatever yeah. it was that would, you know, show up on that screen and give me it, 
I just loved it, man. I loved it. Yeah. And that's a, that's a common thread that I hear with a lot of the actors that I've had a chance to um, talk to is that mm-hmm. that initial love of movies and cinema. And in, in your case, it's, it's very similar to mine. I still remember, and again, a lot of people will never have this experience, but on a Friday night or a Saturday night, going to Blockbuster or Roger's yeah. video and picking out the movies, there was something so magical about that. Uh, what was your favorite memory of working at one of these video stores? You know what? I'll be honest. It was uh, giving my opinion to people about what to rent. I loved it, man. Like people would be like, can you recommend anything? And I'd be like, like, it's so opposite of what customer service is nowadays in any yeah. form. But they're like, could you, I'm like, yes, get, get that one, get that one. And like you said, that hopes that the one you wanted was in, you yeah. know, you'd go move that cover. And if it wasn't <laughs> there, you're like, oh, and plus I think it, um, we wanted to rent stuff because of what first interested us was how it looked on the cover. Yeah. Right? You'd walk down the aisle and if you couldn't find the one you wanted, you, you'd peruse and you'd go, oh, that looks neat. And then you'd read it. And yeah, our, like my kid, I, I talked to her about this and she's five. And I try to explain to her when we're flipping through Apple TV and she's just like, nah, nah, just total disinterest. <laughs> There's no excitement anymore. So, I know, man. Yeah, yeah. It, th- those were some real good times and now just everything is just so accessible to you at just a click of a button whether it's netflix amazon apple tv or i guess for better or worse things just continue to evolve um and i'm sure maybe 10 20 years from now there's going to be even something else that even takes this even further who knows right of course i'm going to show you something that i I pulled out i pulled out of storage recently and uh I, i brought it out to show my kid because I was like, this is what it was. This is what it was. Old, uh, old VHSs. Ah, uh, Superman 2. There we go. Yeah, man. <laughs> Maybe it's old probably the kid. last good Superman of the original Donner <laughs> movies. Right? Here's some old school. Big Trouble in Little China. Look at those. And I had a monster squad in here, which I don't know if you would have even heard of. No, I haven't heard of that one, but I've definitely heard of the first two there. That, that's awesome. <laughs> that's I have a couple of those in my basement as well. And I just saw like yeah. Spider-Man 2 the other day just sitting in VHS there. And I'm like, there's some kid who probably has no idea what this foreign object is. I know. <laughs> it's a VCR, right? Yeah, no clue. No that's, clue. that's crazy. Yeah, and I miss going to theaters like with big movies. Big oh. movies aren't the same. I saw like the original Batman in the theaters. And we sat, we sat in the aisles on the steps because there were so many people in the seats. And we cheered, like, like people lost their minds in yeah. the movie, clapping and cheering. And it was just like, yeah, it was different. It was different. But that's, yeah. how could you not love that stuff, man? Yeah, there's that theater going experience is something that's just so, you can't duplicate it and you can't replicate it either at home. As much as, you know, we're all wanting things at the palm of our hands with, you know, HBO Max or Disney Plus. Yeah, there's something being in the movie theater with the lo- the loud music, with the big screen, the popcorn, the soda, wink, Everything. wink. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just, uh, yeah, it's uh, something beautiful. So, your love of acting and your love of movies. At what point did you know this is something you want to do as a career? Oh, as a career, I had no idea. I had no idea, man. I I had a fond memory of it in high school. Um, I was not the most popular kid. I was very small, awkward, and I did a drama class and uh, I did a scene in there and it connected with everybody. And that was my first time I ever uh, had something so disconnected from myself that made me feel included. Mm. It was like an inclusion to the outside world around me. Um, Anyway, fast forward, um, I'm working in the oil industry in Alberta doing a desk job and uh, bored board, 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 board. And uh, I I look at an ad in the paper in, uh, I I lived in Edmonton. I saw an ad in the paper for acting classes. And I was like, I'm going to go, I'm going to go do this for fun. I've always wanted to do acting because I connected with that thing back in high school. And uh, so then I went to the acting class and uh, that was it. Just kind of got the ball rolling. The guy's like, Hey, do you want to come to Vancouver? Try this out. I'm like, yes, I do. 
So what was your first acting gig when you first started off? What did I do? Um, my very first one. So I started off doing background work. Mm-hmm. I got really involved in background. I, I worked on this great horror film called Valentine. Okay. And uh, uh, it was awesome. It was my first taste of like being on a big movie set with stars that I'd seen working up close with them. Um, and then, you know, you go get an agent, do a couple of commercials and stuff like that. And then I think one of the first TV shows I did was True Calling. It was a yeah, I remember that show. Who, yeah, very small, like one line part on it. And then I did a Canadian show called The Collector. Um, it was uh, a guy that was, uh, I think he's reincarnated or something like that. Uh, anyway, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, it was my first, my first like large scale role. So it was good. That kind of, that kind of got the ball rolling a bit faster. And yeah, then, I, uh, yeah. And I then I worked on Underworld, Underworld 2. Yeah, it's another uh, big franchise there now. Teeny, teeny tiny part, but it was great. <laughs> hey, anything that gets your foot in the door and gets you an acting credit, right? It's, yeah. it's, it's all good there. Now, yeah. what would you say is the biggest difference? Because Canada is such a big central film production hub, Vancouver, Toronto, even yeah. Hamilton now. Uh, yeah. What would you say is the biggest difference between the Canadian film scene versus the American film scene, if there even is one? Well, I think it's, I mean, in Canada, stars are not often made. No. So the celebrity aspect of things, it's starting to change now with these Netflix shows and yeah. Amazon. And they're, I mean, they've had every studio out here, but it's, that scene is a pretty young man's game still, young woman's game. Um, I've noticed a lot of younger actors getting quite large parts and, uh, you know, series regulars, which kind of starts moving them forward. Um, But I would just say the difference is, is the scale. Everything down in the States is taken much more seriously with actors down there. What you find is most of the actors that I knew throughout the duration of time that I've been doing this, that moved down to LA would go down there and of getting parts, bigger parts, but that shoot up here. And the reason was, is because they were down there. So directors, producers would take them more seriously on the acting front. Like these guys are really taking this job seriously, but then they could hire them in Canada because they could work as locals and get a discount. So it works in their benefit, but it works in the actor's benefit too. So, but yeah, it's a scale. I think, I think, I mean, it, to get the jobs, I, the bigger parts, I think you got to be down there and put in your time. Um, but you can have a way bigger uh, regular career up here. Like yeah. to the people down in the States, you look at famous people, they got like 20, 30 credits. That's it. You look at people in Vancouver, they have 130. Yeah. Like it's not on the same page at all. Yeah, I agree with that 100%. And that's, again, a common thread that I keep hearing with a lot of Canadian actors is there's an industry here, but the lack of opportunities is sometimes, you know, it it holds you back. And Hollywood, LA, that's where everything is. And if you want those big roles, you need to be down there because of all the casting agents, all the casting calls, a bit of this, bit of that. Did you ever make the full-time move to LA or were you always centrally based out of Vancouver? It wasn't a full time. So I, I had a a fortunate experience when I was uh, starting out. Um, So what used to happen is you would get uh, a test deal. And so I would put something on tape here, which didn't happen often because your agents are like, ah, what's the point? And I threw something on tape and then they phone you up and they're like, yeah, we're going to fly him down for an audition in front of the director producer. You go to the studio, you sign a big contract. I mean, and everybody in that room, it's a, it's a different ball game, right? I, that day I met Dustin Hoffman's kid and wow. we just chatted for like an hour in the audition room. And, you know, he told me who his dad was and stuff. And I'm like, this is, it's different. This isn't Canada. You know <laughs> what I mean? It's the real deal. And so, yeah, I don't know. I, I did go down there after Harper's Island. Basically the way they say it is, 
you got to go down with some heat. And at that point in time, we had our faces on billboards at uh, the Grove, like 25 feet big. Like it was crazy, man. It was a big ensemble cast. So very fortunate that we got to have that. Um, but it was a different time. It was a big network show, lots of money. Netflix, these things weren't happening then. Yeah. And we premiered at a, a, <laughs> a, a minimal number, 4 million, or I think we started at 8 million viewers, which to the network, a rerun of CSI would get 11 million viewers. So they thought we were doing terrible. But I mean, those numbers. Massive and, numbers. So, yeah, we just da, 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 and it just went down, 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 down. So all that heat is just kind of gone. But the truth about LA is you got to put in the time. Yeah. Anybody who goes down there and is like, it's going to happen now. It's, I don't care what you have. I know some guys have done like smaller parts and gotten some stuff um, in the first year or two, but usually, man, you got to go, you got to go surf the couches and hang out yeah. for a few years, meet people. The whole know. starving artist routine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You got to put in your time uh, like anything. So unless you go down with some big shows on Netflix now, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that's interesting. Now, yeah. I'm going to transition over to what I think honestly is one of the best horror movies I've seen in the last 20 years. And that's Grave Encounters. As I mentioned, it's celebrating its 10th year anniversary this year. And it's just, it's a movie that continues to just keep finding new audiences. And the more people I talk to about this movie, it's like, Hey, you see that clip on YouTube about this grave, whatever thing. And I'm like, yeah, I've seen that movie. And that's how I was originally exposed to it, that whole viral marketing. So I want to do a deep dive on this movie, man, because you quarterback this movie. Lance Preston <laughs> is honestly one of my favorite characters in a movie in a long, long time. And that's a testament to you, man. So for anyone listening who hasn't seen the movie, uh, the synopsis is as follows. The footage follows the crew of a paranormal reality television program who lock themselves in a haunted psychiatric hospital in search of evidence of paranormal activity as they shoot what ends up becoming their final episode. Ooh. Ooh. I hold this movie in such high regard and I truly feel like since maybe the Blair Witch Project that a movie hasn't come along that's pushed the genre of found footage this far. And it's just a smart movie. It's so meta overall with just how it's presented. So let's talk about pre-production, production, and then post. So when were you first approached for this project by the Vicious Brothers? And what was their original pitch to you? Um, so the first, I first got pitched it by a casting director I knew, uh, Laura Brooke. And she just kind of hit me up and was like, hey, these guys are doing this movie. I think you'd be good, you should go out for it. And I was out in Calgary at the time with some family. And um, I was just like, look, I have a tiny little camera. I'll throw a video together and I'll just wing it. Um, they gave me a little blurb. And I'll tell you, I've never, never, ever, ever have I seen a ghost hunting show. <laughs> I didn't know I didn't know who this Zach guy was, nothing, zero. Um, but so I just did it and I just had that vibe to it. Um, I don't know if it's the way they wrote it or whatever, but um, that was it. I sent the tape off. And uh, at that time, it was called Cold Spots. Ah. The movie. Yeah. And um, yeah, they just uh, phoned me for uh, a conversation uh, when I got back. And they didn't call me in after that. They were just like, yeah, we, we want you. Because you know, yeah. like, uh, they were holding auditions out here. Um, but yeah, and then I did not meet the Vicious Brothers until we walked up, I walked up the stairs of the psychiatric hospital and they were both sitting there. It's so funny, they were telling me that because they were just, they were so new, right? Just writers. They wrote this thing in like a couple of days or something like that. They just wanted to make a movie quick. So they were like, let's throw something together. Um, they threw this thing together and uh, you know, I was nervous meeting these guys. They were nervous meeting me. <laughs> and uh, and they were just so easy going. Everything, everything just felt like home from that yeah. moment. And it's interesting because my next question was, 
what are your thoughts on this whole ghost hunting reality show phenomenon, especially like back in like the 2010s and nines, those things really took off. And I remember watching a bunch of them with my brothers. Now, once you got the role, did you visit any of these shows? You know, the whole Zach Bagans thing from, from ghost adventures, ghost hunters. What was that all about? So look, I knew from just like anybody else would, I knew about the shows. I knew kind of what the premise was of, you know, searching for something, hearing yeah. EVPs, that kind of thing. I just didn't know who Zach Baggins was. I'd never seen that show. I think I saw the one with the three guys, big bald guys. <laughs> yeah, kid. Ghost Hunters. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I'd seen one of those. Um, but I think for me, it was one of those things. I'm, I want a results. Like I'm a results guy. So that's what drew me to this movie more than anything, um, because you finally get to see something. And that's what everybody tunes in to watch those shows. <laughs> you don't tune in for the, for the assumption, but that's right. what you get every time. Oh, of course. And it used to crush me. <laughs> you know, it used to crush my soul. I, I, I think I watched one or two and it was like a flashlight sitting on the floor flickering. And I was like, man, Come on, man. <laughs> I'm out. I'm out. I can't, I don't want to watch this no more. I can't, I can't <laughs> do that. Right. And, and I'm a skeptic. I'm a skeptic with any of that kind of stuff. So I'm like, nah, anyway, but so I like this uh, script because it, yeah, it got results. Yeah. So. so now, as I mentioned, the character of Lance Preston, he's such like a charismatic, cool dude. What, what was the thought process and your personal creative process about creating this character? What, what was, was there a collaboration with Vicious Brothers, or was it kind of you going off the script? What exactly was the overall layout? Everything was pretty easygoing. There was a couple of key points they wanted to hit whenever we had dialogue, but other than that, it was on the fly. Not just me, uh, suggestions from them, anything like that. Like doing certain uh, inflections at certain times, like really hitting a point. Um, and I think it just kind of it met wherever this Zach Baggins guy lived. I don't know if ghost hunting shows or the way that they uh, take place kind of lends itself to that. No. But any dialogue that I was uh, saying, it just, I don't know what it was, man. It just, it came out that way. I'll be honest with you. It just did. <laughs> there was no real, there was no real thought process as to, I think it was cheese dick. They just wanted him to be a cheese dick. Gotcha. So cheese, ham it up, right? And so I think it just innately came out like that. Yeah, and that's funny. And again, that just goes back to like the whole comparison that I always say with the Blair Rich Project and Grave Encounters. It's very yeah. DIY. It, you could tell that a lot of it's like on the go in terms of rehearsals and all of that. Was that a big thing or was it more important? Again, because you guys are capturing this meta version of this found footage movie with there is yeah. an existing television program within the movie. Was yeah. it keep it natural and stay away from rehearsal? Was it a lot of improvising or what, what exactly as we dive into the production part, how, how was the overall production of it? Yeah, it was great, man. I mean, we all went to the location for, I think it was 13 nights and uh, each one of us got uh, a camcorder to hold on to to film ourselves, do whatever. And these guys sifted through all that footage after and put wow. the movie together, crazy. But um, yeah, man, everything, like a lot of it was just improvised. Just, you guys need to get to a location. You cannot get there. You hit a dead end, like every now and again, you'd be like, you hit a dead end, you can't get past there. What are you guys gonna do? And dialogue, dialogue, fighting real tension lots of real tension man there was a lot of times with like the tc character and um it's uh, mad and yeah. oh yeah that there was lots of tension i mean and our natural uh relationships just showed up right away like sasha kind of became a little sister to me right away um uh tc was just a wild card yeah he knew what he was going to do and he's like that as a human being he's lovely but as soon as you call action, you were like, whoa. <laughs> and so react off it because the directors are like, yes, they were loving They're it. They're loving right? it. Yeah. yeah that, that's, it's, it's really interesting. So when you guys are actually filming the movie, is it 
actors, I know you mentioned you're all holding your own camcorders. Is there an actual crew around you guys as well for the most part? Or how many people at any given time were on set? Um, I would say there was probably like 15 to 20. Okay. But directly on set, a lot of times it was just the directors carrying a camera or uh, like stationary setups. They would set the camera up, they'd leave the room, I'd be in with my camera, that camera would be filming me, like for the security cam footage and all that kind of stuff. Everything needed to look like it was not yeah. being filmed. Organic being and stuff. real, yeah. Yeah, they'd be in another room hollering on a walkie, you'd have a walkie on your side, just turn it on and off, that kind of thing. Okay, and yeah. we just touched up on a bit of that. One of the best parts about this movie is that organic and natural communication and acting between all of you, all the different actors, you know, as you mentioned, yeah. TC, Sasha, Matt, and of course, the scene stealer, Houston Gray. <laughs> so overall, did you have different dynamics with each character and each actor or and just some of like the craziness that Houston and the campiness and cheesiness of it? <laughs> like on set, how, how do you guys feel as you're making it? Yeah, I mean, you just vibe off of what everybody else is doing. Mackenzie Gray, who played Houston, is such a, an old veteran actor. Yeah. So you just eat up whatever he's putting out there. And, it, you know, as far as we were concerned, we'd watch stuff and you go, oh, man, is all that stuff going to work from everybody? You know, every time I'd say something, I'd, you know, do something way over the top. You're like, this is going to work. And it just was exactly what these characters were going to end up being. And uh, yeah, man, it was great. Everybody was so on point with who they wanted to be yeah. after like one or two days that it was just go. It was go time after that. And it was, it was just fun. I mean, like I said, the guys are so good. The directors were so good at uh, knowing that they got what they needed on like, say their master mm -hmm. and or whatever camera they set up. And then just knowing that they could find some stuff throughout right and sometimes they'd you know if i'm holding the camera myself they'd walk in and just like tilt it up so you know i could you could see exactly where i was and stuff like yeah it was um yeah, it was so collaborative everything yeah and, and it shows it really does in the movie and just it's an ensemble cast although you're quarterbacking it and you're the lead of the movie it's just your relationships with different characters and how you all collaborate together as a unit and then individually it's just so evident on screen lastly on the production this is a question i ask any horror guest that i have on the show so i asked this to ed sanchez who directed the blair rich project and marcus nispel who directed the reboot of the texas chainsaw massacre i want to get your point of view on this especially from an actor's lens it's a double-edged question when you're making horror movies one, does it ever get spooky on set? And two, how do you know if the scares are working? Because unlike comedy, which, or drama or action, maybe eight out of 10, nine out of 10 times, you know it's working. With yeah. horror, it's so much more subjective to everyone's just personal views. How do you know when it's working and when it's not? Um, so uh, to answer your first question, yeah. It can get spooky on set. Um, we shot nights in this old abandoned psychiatric hospital. A lot of the stuff you saw in there is just stuff that's in the rooms. We just used it. The bathtubs, everything. Oh, wow. the, yeah. I mean, it was really used for all this kind of stuff. And I've said this in many other interviews. There's rooms off of rooms off of rooms. like, wow. And it's pitch black in there. Yeah. It's a little bit of a different vibe now because even since then, it's been, that building is used in, I've shot in it, I think, like dozens of times as different things, like crazy different things. You never recognize it. And so the scariness kind of dissipates after it's been used so much. Yeah. But anyway, uh, like the third floor in the first movie was locked off. We, nobody was allowed up there. Oh. Period. Yeah. Lots of rumors, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, we had batteries die, like as soon as they put them on the camera. Mm. you know we go off into the room and the, the battery they're like gotta change batteries I'm like how's that even possible yeah um, and yeah like i said you go into a room it would have a closet you go into that closet there'd be a room in the closet 
<laughs> and then like a hole into the floor. What? And you're like, I'm leaving this place. I don't yeah. have nothing to do with this. So yeah, there, there is some spooky stuff if you're out alone. But for me, if you're with crew and everything like that, it's not. It's like after day one or day two, it kind of that kind of goes yeah. away or is that still kind of linger around you? Well, it depends how tired you are. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it, it, it lingers depending on what you do. You know, sometimes they tell me to go shoot a scene over in this far off room and they were to stay back down the hallway. And I'm like, eh, that doesn't sound great to me. And I don't even believe in that stuff. So I don't get it. <laughs> I guess subconsciously, it's just like, hey, I'm in this movie. And then you hear this little noise. It's like, wait a second. Is this yeah. the director is just effing with me? Or is this something like, <laughs> that's funny. Yeah. Yeah, yeah for sure. For now, sure. The second part of it is, do you know if the scares are working? Or is it one of those things where it's, you just trust the process? You trust yeah. what's written, what's directed, and then you kind of go off by that? Listen, man, I was a skeptic the whole time. From the time when we sat down and they started to show me the renderings of the ghosts and stuff like that. And I was just like, oh man, that's kind of cheesy. <laughs> and honestly, I don't think, so um, Colin Minahan and Stuart Ortiz are really great at seeing what's on the camera and going, yeah, we got it. Yeah. yeah we got it. And then all the little things creating the guy on the roof with the tongue. And yeah. there were so many things in there that I did not know were going to work. And I don't think they knew either. We all went to the premiere at Tribeca Film Festival and sat in the back in the audience and, and really watched it work for the first time. We, and we got out after and we were like, man, people were laughing. They were terrified. They were like, it was everything. It ran the gambit. So I don't know if we ever really knew until, you know, you screen it type of thing. That's so true. Because again, when you're in this movie and as you mentioned, you shot for it, like what, like maybe two weeks, yeah. it's just in and out kind of a process. And it's, it's funny because I find that there's so much humor in this movie as well. As you mentioned, it's, you got best of both worlds. There's a lot of humor within the cast, within your interactions with each other. And then there's some genuine scary scenes especially yeah. that girl that this show and, and she's the thumbnail on the YouTube video and everything where her mouth yeah. opens up wide or even the trippy ending there, man. When, when you're shooting some of those scenes in those hallways in the basement or it, those little tunnels. Yeah, that, that corridor, that tunnel is bizarre. Yeah, that looked bizarre. Yeah, I think they used to run like food and stuff from, because there's buildings up on hills and it, those tunnels go like up. Kind of connect everything together. But they're super dark, super wet, super, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't hang out down there. No, no neither would I there. That's so now you guys wrap up the movie. Yeah. Um, and now we're diving into the post-production of it. Before the movie even launches, they launch this viral marketing campaign that just goes on YouTube. And again, we all know how big social media and viral marketing is today in 2020. But yeah. let's go back 10 years to 2010. Yes, Instagram was around, Facebook was around, YouTube was around, but it's not anywhere close to what the giant that it is today. Yeah. Now, I, I checked this morning before our conversation, the original Grave Encounters YouTube trailer that they released, it's still, it has 32 million views, man. That's wow. still massive. That's bigger than most Hollywood blockbuster movies till this day. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's wild, man. And especially yeah. like, what was your reaction when you started getting word or you started seeing some of these viral marketing pop up here and there? Were you like, what the hell is this? Or were you kind of like, whoa, they're really on to something? Everybody was. That was not a plan, right? Mm. That was, I, I'm pretty sure, I don't know for sure if Colin had like this, this guy that they sent it to um, I can't remember where he was, just some like marketing guy in Egypt or some, something like that. And he put this thing on YouTube and then it just, that happened in a month. There was over a million views Blood. and everybody was like, what? And I think it, it ended up starting to do what Blair Witch did because I was a big Blair Witch fan, big, like, uh, there was a young guy from my hometown who was an actor out here on a show called Breaker High. 
he was friends with one of my buddy's older brothers. Well, somehow there was this tape floating around in Hollywood of this Blair Witch. Nobody knows if it's real. Nobody knows if it's fake, whatever, but it's a VHS cassette. And he's got a copy if I want to see it. So the legend was born before the movie was seen. Yeah. I feel like, like Grave Encounters, you know, as I was watching the pre-production of the ghosts and stuff like that, and I was like, well, that doesn't look real. And then all of a sudden it dawns on me, well, how does anybody know what looks real? Yeah. What it's supposed to be, what it's whatever. And then as soon as it got out there and the views started coming, everybody starts looking up, are these guys dead? Did this happen? I mean, one of the most common things on Google was like, is Sean Rogerson dead? <laughs> I was like, man, and people would Twitter me about it. And I was just like, is this real? Like the people, but how do I know what legend was born to them, right? I mean, that's how these things come about. So yeah, we were all totally surprised. We had no idea that that was happening. And that's what drew uh, Tribeca Film Festival into it before we had sold it to anyone. So they wanted to premiere it. It was like, yeah, come to New York. We're going to put you on the one of these big stages and we'll do it. Yeah. Yeah, it's just wild because that's how I discovered the movie originally is just seeing that little viral video that was just floating around. I saw it, I showed it to my brother, he showed it to some friends, I showed it to some friends. And it's, yeah. just, it's just funny, the power of word of mouth and social media. And, and that's why this movie is just, in, in my opinion, just it's so advanced and it just innovates on what was already done with the Blair Witch Project and now kind of brings that into the generation of the internet. The internet was around back in the late 90s, but it, it's not, again, what it is today. And it's, yeah. just, it's just massive what happened. Now, the movie comes out and it, it's, it made over $5 million. When you're just sitting back and watching the movie for the first time, or even generally just reminiscing about the shoot, did you have any idea whatsoever that this would take a life of its own? this way or was it kind of like hey this is a movie I did for two weeks I've done many other things maybe some people will watch it maybe some won't what was your initial perception of how everyone else viewed it yeah you know I think it was surprise I think we were all really surprised I think once Tribeca got interested in it and and then we all went down there and watched it with the audience and stuff like that and there was so much talk and then Tribeca wanted us to do a second film and they wanted to, you know, help produce it and do the whole thing. So that was an inclination that, oh man, maybe this, maybe this something was works. something. Yeah. And I mean, we all, we all felt great about it. We all developed great relationships from it. Um, but I didn't really think that it was like that until I, th- I think it got on Netflix. Yeah. It's on maybe Netflix. It wasn't on, on Netflix. Yeah. Well, but back then, I'm trying to think in like 2010, 20. Yeah, yeah. No, was fair. Netflix around? I think it was. Maybe I'm but not it sure. Came, but... It came out on Netflix, and uh, and a lot of people had downloaded. But I would get lots of messages. I get lots of people hitting me up. Hey, man, I, we found this movie online, and we're sitting down watching it. And it's the first time that people were never shooting me a message like, "Hey, saw you on a movie." People were always talking about the movie first. And then how they liked me in it. Yeah. Right. So they really liked the movie and they're like, man, I, I just watched the movie and I wasn't even thinking about you. And I was like, so it's a good movie. <laughs> it, it, it is. Yeah. It and had nothing then, to do with me. It just had to do with the, the movie. So yeah. that was great. So, and you know what? I know you're not going to admit to it, but you're just being a little modest. A lot of it is to do with you, man. And, and I'll give credit to the entire cast. You guys are really genuinely put up a great performance and it's just so natural and organic and that's the beauty of some of these diy small budget movies is you just the actors get to flourish and you guys really get to just make things your own and you kind of briefly touched up on it about the sequel yeah grave encounters too listen man let's be honest nine out of ten times horror movie sequels are absolutely trash at least nine out of ten times this movie Again, it's not, it's nothing can duplicate the original, but I thoroughly enjoyed it, man. And it still has the DNA of the first movie, but it kind of stands on its own two feet. Now you guys make the second one or even before you guys start making it, do you feel that 
overall on set and the production, is it even possible to replicate what you guys did with the first one? Because now you have this massive movie that's been out and this viral marketing. Does it affect you psychologically that I'm now acting as Lance Preston rather than just you acting in the first one, maybe as yourself and just. I mean, look, man, it it was different also in the sense like the budget was way different. Yeah. Way different. Right. We had green screens, we had studios. It was very better craft services. Yeah. Yes. (laughs) And you know, I got to, I got to, uh, be gifted the chance to do something crazy, which, you know, so it was, it was totally fun for me. I was, I was very much my own world. The other guys had the pressure to recreate. And I think they did like when I've seen that movie, that whole beginning act is so familiar and they replicated the grave encounters feel so much. Um, you know, like anything, it goes a little off the wheels at certain times and whatever. And what can you do? But yeah. um, you're dealing with craziness, right? And uh, yeah, I think, it, look, the vibe was just different. We had a lot of the same crew there, mm-hmm. um, but it was just bigger. It was just bigger and, and you no know, different young actors just starting out, guys who've gone on and done really great big things and stuff like that. And they were fantastic. They were so invested, all those uh young actors and stuff they were so invested it was awesome yeah and overall uh, it's just they made a good movie and at the end of the day that's all you can really ask for especially for horror movies where the track record where it'll have a massive box office opening weekend number one they'll green light it the next weekend and then they kind of just rush it out to get it out like within the next year so it's still in people's mind and and that's the beauty of a movie like grave encounters one and even grave encounters two Now, staying on the topic of Grave Encounters, do you think there's any more life in this franchise? And and would you be interested in coming back as Lance in some weird way or as a prequel? Or what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, look, man, uh, just because of the love for it, um, I would always be down to revisit it. I've talked with um, Colin Minahan, uh, the one half of the Vicious Brothers, about it many, many times. There's been different avenues talked about, there's been stuff written, there's been uh, many discussions, but there's a lot of logistics that go along with it. Yeah. That, you know, can it happen, can it not? Uh, uh, yeah, rights, uh, things are all over the place. But um, yeah, there's story there, man. And especially with like the anthology series and stuff like that of what's happening nowadays, like American Horse yeah. and all these kind of things on, you know, streaming platforms and whatever. Yeah, there's lots of room for it. And I've never seen anything found footage of any sort on any of those platforms, not as a series. So who knows? Who knows? You just need, you need people to be interested. And, uh, you know, you got to be sure if you're going to reinvest time in something from the past especially when people's careers are going in a direction. They're like, do I want to halt? But you also have to stop and give respect to the thing that has had maybe some of the most legs out of anything a lot of us have done in a very strange way, you know? Yeah, no, for sure. I agree with that. When was the last time you watched Grave Encounters of Honor, Grave Encounters 2? (laughs) I don't know, man. It, It would have been, oh God, I couldn't tell you. I couldn't tell you. I, I, it's got to be over. Do you, do you rewatch a lot of your work or is it kind of like so you, you do it, you put it out there like a lot of actors. It's, I don't want to say cringy watching yourself or your two self. It can be. It can yeah, be. It's man. like, you know, oh, I should have done this. I should have done that. Even though it's great, but as creatives, we all pinpoint little tiny things that no one else can see. Yeah. Listen, man, here's my theory on that is as an actor, it's not about us. It's not about us at all. We, we are a vessel for the directors and the editors and the writers. That's it. So when we go on, you know, when I watched movies as a kid, I would want to feel something. And that was the gift. And I would admire the actors for giving me those feelings. Right. And a lot of actors that I talked to, they do a scene on set and they're like, oh, I didn't really feel it. Whatever. And you go talk to the director and they're like, that was great, man. We got it. We got it. 
So in the end, it's not about, it's not about us, right? It's about what everybody's interpreting from our story. You're just a storyteller. So as far as people getting cringy watching themselves, well, you got to not watch yourself. You got to watch the show, right? If you can watch the movie and what you can do is you can learn from it. You can pick out some things and go, oh, I could have done that. So next time I know that I don't need to do so much, but it's still, it's not about you. If you're going to look at something, you look at it for research, but you don't, you don't look at it to judge, man. You got to watch the story because it's everybody else's work. There's so much more work goes into it. So, yeah, and that's interesting. I've actually never heard that perspective of it. Um, yeah. Yeah. And again, like to the, maybe the average person who doesn't have a love for film and cinema, like you and I do a lot of them to them, they don't know what a DP is or what a a producer does or a line producer. And I I guess once you're in this medium, it's almost your responsibility to acknowledge them and acknowledge their work where once you put your presentation out or your skills out, it no longer belongs to you almost. It's it's part of this big story that's ultimately being told in the movie yeah it seems like that yeah it's acting is such a I mean it was a big learning curve for me and it's still it never ends and you're always self-conscious and you're always wondering but look man I've asked directors you know when I was younger I'm like you know he's giving direction to somebody else and I'll be like oh excuse me is is everything okay with me and he'll be like if I had anything to tell you or to change I'd let you know (laughs) and you're like what the heck right and so now it's just developed into you know as soon as the scene's done you kind of lean over and you go you guys got it they're like yeah like cool i don't care how i felt about it i don't care man (laughs) i'm just like if you're good i'm good (laughs) that's it nice and easy (laughs) as you transition over from grave encounters to sean rogers in your what would you say are your top three favorite movies. If you can't narrow it down to three, maybe give me a couple more. What are the three movies you can rewatch over and over again? I almost don't want to say it, man. I'm a, <laughs> I'm a sh- sh- guy. Um, a lot, a lot, not all the time. I used to be much more into like, I want to sit down and I want to cry. That was like my shows. Right. Um, but now I'm like a Marvel guy, man. I like oh, yeah. to just sit and just watch stuff that's fun. Yeah. And it doesn't it doesn't make me sweat nothing. It literally will just take up my time. So I'm a big uh, Marvel fan. Um, but as far as movies that I would rewatch, what comes to see mind? This again. This is where the generation changed. I used to just pull a VHS off of my shelf of VHSs and do it. And now you start flicking and you go, you go buy all those ones because there's something new you haven't seen. Mm-hmm. Um, I honestly don't know if I can tell you what I, I rewatched, but it's depressing. I rewatched The House of Sand and Fog, which is like this deeply depressing Ben Kingsley movie. Oh my God. But fantastic acting. Okay, and just, of course. Sometimes, yeah, sometimes I just want to feel, man. Yeah, sometimes I, I want to. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, I, I've seen Titanic maybe once or twice here and there. I just want to feel. <laughs> Talk about yeah. That. You know what I did? I rewatched a series on Netflix called Kingdom. Yeah, I've heard of that. I've heard of that. Oh, dude. Listen, do yourself a favor. Okay. I watched it two times, like straight back to Is that back. the mixed martial arts one? Yeah. Yeah. And listen, I'm not a, I'm not a bro, bro. Let's throw down type of guy. None of that stuff gets me, but the, the creator of this show gave each character so much that, and, and they live in it. And every okay. man, it, it's such good TV. Yeah. Ch- right. Do yourself a favor and check For it everyone out. listening, check out Kingdom. Uh, I'd have heard a lot of good things about it as well. And Jonathan that's the Tucker. thing, we're like in this like golden age of TV where yeah. they're putting in so much money into these like 10 episodes here, 10 episodes there. And they're, it's, pretty much a film production at this point right oh yeah and they have way more money <laughs> it's oh, crazy of yeah. course now I, i'm going to hold you on to this since you're such a big figure in the last 10 years in the horror movie genre what yeah. is one or two horror movies that just scare the hell out of you <laughs> so i won't i watched uh 
I won't even watch the trailer for The Grudge. Those Grudge <laughs> movies. It's a good one, though. It's a good movie. When those things like come out of the back of the head, oh. I'm like, no go. And 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 I'm talking old school. This is old school to me because I'm not I'm not fully on uh, board with the current stuff. But I was a big fan of Amityville. Yep. Uh, and uh, what was that other one? Oh, The Ring. Oh. So, so yeah, when I first watched The Ring, uh, it was on DVD. And they had a setting on the DVD that when you watch that video that they put in the yeah. machine, and it would not shut off on your DVD. <laughs> like, you couldn't shut off your DVD. Wow. And I, I put it in, all cool and stuff, and put it in and played it. And then I was just like... <laughs> Yeah, and like, the images and stuff in that little video. Yeah, yeah. and I'm like, I don't need to watch it. And then I started like clicking buttons, and it wouldn't shut off. So I unplugged the machine. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's funny because I have the VHS of the ring, and before yeah. the movie starts, they show that little thirty second, forty five second creepy imagery with the Samara girl. Oh man, that that shit just scares you, man. Which is hurts. literally the opening credit scene to almost every new tv show out there it's like all like horror tv shows and stuff like that they show things like ripping apart and it's yeah. all slow motion cartoony and you're like <laughs> this is all disturbing yeah so i know you mentioned just now that you're not all in with the new crop of horror movies yet. and i agree with that a lot of them rely on jump scares and there's not much depth i can in it. see i don't jump ever the I don't know if it's because I've always kind of been like this. The the music, the the, the atmosphere, the pauses, yeah, the atmosphere, the pauses, anything. I'll, I'll be sitting uh, with my kid and I'll be just like, you know, be careful here. Why? Boom! I'm like, you could just ah, it's a mile away from me. I don't know. So, I've always been that way. So, is there a movie that sticks out in the last ten years that maybe somewhat got you to a point where you're like, you know what, this movie's actually pretty good. The Conjuring movies or Annabelle or anything like that, Sinister. Mm, 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 mm. Which did I, wow, well, in the last, how long? Like 10 years, you would say, like in the last decade. Is there anything that, that stands one, out? I can't remember the name of it where the guys come in the masks into the, the house. Out oh, the, the Strangers. That. That, that's a good one, man. It literally made me not want to ever live somewhere far away. <laughs> like I just, that's such a real basic thing to me. Yeah. Anything that's not poltergeisty or ghosty and stuff. Cause like I said, I'm not a big uh, believer in that stuff. Yeah. Like the paranormal real deal. You know what I'm big time into right now is uh, like uh docu-series. Yeah. So the real, the real deal horror, you know, and that stuff freaks me out. And it's that kind of stuff, like just yeah. like, oh man, and that's interesting. That's gonna affect my soul. That's very interesting. And again, the strangers—it's such a basic concept of just human beings, but the atmosphere that's created in this movie with those creepy masks and that little child, and just yeah. sometimes when you stick to basics, it just works, and and it's, that's why that movie just it works in so many levels. Yeah, to me, it's the mystery of the cruelty, like wondering how somebody's brain works. You know, I literally just watched one a couple of days ago, and it was like this girl's longtime two best buddies, these guys, and they end up killing her. And after knowing her their whole life yeah. for some money, and I'm just like, that's real horror to me. Yeah. Like, how does somebody... From, from nothing. And then you watch these guys talk about it on like a hidden tape, like it was nothing. Yeah. And you're like, that is the most terrifying thing. Not knowing people, not, not really feeling like, I'm, I like to believe I'm a good judge of character, but man, if there's anything that can, you know, kick you in the butt of it and go, maybe you never know, you yeah. know, that scares me. <laughs> no, I, yeah. And agree again, sometimes the scariest things are, what's within us and it yeah. sounds cliche and cheesy as hell but at the same time it's it's true man like you yeah. watch so many especially with netflix they have a new documentary on like serial killers every other week we're so it's sad and messed up that we're so drawn to some of these things we're like yeah. oh serial killer documentaries yeah. but if you think about it it's too it's oh it's just horrific what happens 
and he's well, crying. To it, like you're saying, I mean, but people enter have been entertaining themselves for years on some of the most gruesome horror yeah. movies you could ever imagine, right? So it's really no different. It's no different, right? In the sense of uh, the content, it's just one's real and one's written by somebody that it's hopefully not real. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's it's wild here our, I, our minds always think in these ways right you can't change it so that's why people put the pen to the paper and you yeah. create it and then it's just sort of the, the car crash analogy right it's like when you see a car crash your eyes are just kind of glued to it it's like yes. it's horrific and you never want that to happen to you or your loved ones but naturally how the human mind works it's like whoa what's going on there and as you're driving you kind of just look by it it's, it's, it's messed up man yeah 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 you don't want to but this happens. This happens. <laughs> As we wrap up here with Sean Rogerson, it is now time for a segment we like to call the final act. Mr. Rogerson, 15 <laughs> questions about your likes, your dislikes, and everything in between. We make it rapid fire. We'll try to get through them in 60 seconds. If we oh can't, it's all you good. Saw thought, you saw my thought process on finding <laughs> a favorite movie. Can you imagine this? Oh my gosh. Hey, you know what? Don't worry about the time limit as well. I just want to get your raw, real answers. Are you up okay. for the challenge? All right, man. Let's All do right. it. <laughs> Movies or TV shows? Uh, TV shows. Theater or watch at home? Theater. What was the last movie you watched at a theater? Oh... See, this where my brain doesn't work. Uh, it's got to be a kid show. Probably like Frozen 2. <laughs> Frozen 2 it is. What's one sequel better than the original? Uh, Grave Encounters 2. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, Walk right into that one. Uh, yeah, yeah. Now, Superman 2, like we were talking about earlier. There we go. Superman 2. That's uh, definitely not Superman 4, Quest for Peace, or whatever the hell it was called. Uh, <laughs> what's the best trilogy of all time? Ooh, probably Indiana Jones. Should Hollywood reboot Back to the Future? Absolutely not. Never. Ever, Expand ever. on that. I, you know what? I hear that answer every time, and I never... We'll pause the time here for a sec. Do you think that it's just some movies just are meant not to be touched? Or do you think that, hey, you know what? People will still have the original. We can make something new out of this. Yeah, um... I just think that we need to start sticking to original content. That is why I think there are so many disappointments is because there is no originality anymore. They're just trying to remake for Sequels, the reboots, remakes. You, here's the problem. You cannot remake a movie that was put out at a time when everything was brand new. Yeah. Everything was breaking ground, right? Every one of these classic movies that we remember Goonies, uh, Back to the Future, yeah. E.T., Jaws, whatever. Star Wars, all these things. You can't, you can't make a Star Wars again. You can't make those things look new. Yeah. I don't care what you have, right? It, James Cameron's trying to do this stuff with his avatars, but you just can't. You can't relive these moments, and we have to not make them like that because they will never live up to the real deal. Plus, Michael J. Fox could never ever be even close to replaced christopher never. lloyd as doc brown no nah. christopher lloyd never none of <laughs> it you could never ever ever get a peep of that beauty that was made never it's funny because everyone just talks about hey let's just get tom holland and robert downey jr as doc brown and marty mcfly and it's just like yeah. ah, it still doesn't work yeah I, I agree i thought that he would be a good marty in his own right i, I had thought about this before but it's just it will never, you can't make it new, no. man. And kids nowadays, I try to show this stuff to my kid and she watched it for five minutes. She's like, this is boring dad. Yeah. Even, even the quality that I loved, but it's because it's not new to her. There's nothing yeah. breaking ground, man. She wants fast, flashy, just whatever. Yeah. Our attention spans are just so much smaller now with smartphones and all of this that it's like, Hey, yeah. a slow burn or just it's, it doesn't hold up maybe for some people who knows. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. There's, there's just nothing new. You can't, that stuff was legend when it came out. So yeah. I don't know. All right, let's get back to the question. So <laughs> favorite action movie. Oh, I was a big Van Damme movie. Uh, guy, but I don't know if you call it an action movie, but Bloodsport's my, one oh, of my favorite classic. movies. Ever. Classic. So on the top of that, let's just throw this in there. Mortal Kombat or Bloodsport? 
Oh, like the original Mortal Kombat. The original, movie. with the theme song and all that. Dude, that was so good. Again, I have both VHSs. Uh, look, I have to go with Bloodsport because I watched. Yeah, I watched that so often. <laughs> all right, fair enough. Fair enough. Summer or fall? What do you prefer more? Oh, dang! Good, good question. Um, I like fall, man. I'm gonna go fall. fall. Does pineapple belong on pizza? Yeah, I eat Hawaiian. <laughs> All right. I'm seriously considering if I should edit that out, but since you've been so good today, man, uh, I'll leave that in there. Okay. All right. Yeah, yeah. I get <laughs> it. I totally understand. <laughs> <laughs> Breaking Bad or Game of Thrones? Breaking Bad. Lord of the Rings or Harry Potter? Harry Potter. Your favorite role besides Lance Preston? Oh, uh, uh, I'll go with uh, Alistair from uh, this series, Canadian series called Bitten. All right. I played the big bad guy. That was good. Good stuff. Favorite memory on the set of 12 Rounds 2 with WWE uh, Studios? <laughs> uh, my favorite memory? Because yeah. it was terrifying. Uh, what do you want, the short version? It was just that, it was just this, uh, big speech I had in a hotel room when there was a uh, an investigation going on and I remember it was my first day on set with Roll uh, he's the director and he holds the cameras he's he's in the shot right and uh, they call action um, and they just given me they'd offered me this bigger role I went out for a tiny role they offered me this big role all these lines everything like that anyway they call action the girl walks in, starts delivering her line. She's the lead detective. I come in, I get about two lines into my dialogue, get, and I freeze. Ah. And I can't, I can't remember. And cut, roll comes up to me and he goes, hey, what's the problem? <laughs> like, oh. just no, nothing. And he goes, and he goes, you good? And I'm like, yeah, he goes, good. We need to get through this. And I was like, Woo! never again man never again but i'll tell you it was one of my favorite moments because it just it just slapped me in the face and was like man hey, you know what? sometimes you need that man no matter what avenue of work you're in sometimes you know the best way to learn is to just fall on your face sometimes right yeah yeah and i didn't know who randy orton was otherwise i'd say it was damn man him but yeah I mean, next question yeah well how was he on set was he a cool guy or was he just like oh like, man I, I, they're I wrestlers just, right they're like you know yeah, I've had this weird thing with wrestlers in my life. I, I was at a bar having a cigar chatting with uh, uh, Triple H when I was what? younger. I introduced him to the Trailer Park Boys. <laughs> <laughs> and then I did uh, this TV show Psych with uh, John Cena. Oh, and wow. so I got to spend a week with John Cena, who's the biggest human being on the planet. And then uh, at Randy Orton, who my friends got me to get autographs for their kids because I didn't know he was. <laughs> Hey. But yes, they're all cool. And they're all gigantic human beings. Oh, it definitely looks like it. Yeah. yeah. Now, favorite characters besides Lance in the Grave Encounter series? Um, so I was, I don't know his name in Grave 2. Uh, it, it's played by Dylan Playfair. Okay. He's one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. um, he's the, the dopey, dopey guy. Uh, Sounds job. familiar. I, I don't remember the name of his character, but I know what you're yeah. talking about. I know what you're getting. Um, at. And then uh, I'm going to say everybody in Grave One. <laughs> everybody. Straight across the board, man. All Fair. those boys, all Fair. those girls, they were awesome. All right. This is going to be a tough one. Grave yeah. Encounters One or Grave Encounters Two? Not nah, Grave One, man. <laughs> <laughs> and grave lastly, one. describe Grave Encounters in one word. unexpected bam we made it through Oof. the final act <laughs> we made it through the act maybe a bit more than the 60 seconds but it's all good we had some nice <laughs> yeah, insight in there we got some in-depth about triple h loving cigars and just <laughs> your love of wrestling and or lack of wrestling i don't know no, you know what? and i loved wrestling man i loved it but i was the rock 
time. I was like uh, the whole the attitude era. So the, the, the next generation. Yeah, yeah, in the late '90s, Stone Cold, The Rock, yeah. Triple H, oh, yeah. Shawn Michaels, NWO. Oh, oh yeah, I went to yeah. I went to those things, man. I got crazy. Bro, I I grew up on that, especially when you have three other brothers. Like it's all yeah. we did. We watched pro wrestling growing up. That, that's that's oh, yeah, awesome. John, where can we find you online? Uh, just Twitter. Just Twitter, man. That's about the only thing I use for uh, social media. <laughs> it's, I'm such an old man now. Yeah, Twitter. I started, I think, when Grave came out, and that's about it. <laughs> All right. You can find Sean on Twitter. Hey, man, thank you so much for being a guest on the show today. And yeah. thank you for your contribution to the creative arts, and especially the Canadian film industry. You, you've had your hands on a lot. And man, trust me, Grave Encounters is a movie that it's the first horror movie I recommend to anyone who asks me, hey, is there a horror movie that I can watch? And I'm giving you guys full credit for that. And especially you, you killed it in that movie. I I'm proud that it was a Canadian production and that, you know, we made a movie that will hopefully stand the test of time. Yeah, well, I think it has, man. And I'm the same as you. I honestly, I never uh, just offered up. Uh, that I was an actor and like recommended a movie to people ever until Grave Encounters. And I was just like, you know, people are, oh, you act? I'm like, yeah, yeah, man, you should check this out. I, I always, 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 man. I was very, very, very proud of being a part of that. So it's thank fun. you. I thank you, man. It. Hey, stay safe. And you know what? One day, man, when the world opens up, we'll have to do this in person. We'll get you out to Toronto for a Grave Encounters showing at midnight in a theater somewhere. And yeah, uh, that'd be awesome. Okay. That sounds very cool.